All right. We're going to be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, actually verse 17. That's <clears throat> where we're going to start reading. We're going to go back after this, after the introduction, and, and pick up a little bit of the context before that so we can kind of, you know, know what was being said here. And this is part two of last week's message entitled, Christ the Difference Maker. And the idea there is uh, Christ is the one who makes the difference between saved and lost, heaven and hell. It's all focused on Him. He is the preeminent one. Everything is headed up in Him. Everything points to Him. That's the focus. That's the central theme of all Scripture. And uh, there was, uh, hey, we could do a 20-part series on this. This is really the whole the whole essence of the ministry is that Christ is the difference maker. And uh, in the introduction, maybe we'll talk more about that specific contemporary phrase that I've chose to use. Um, but in verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, we'll pick up there. For Christ did not send me to baptize. This is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. Remember all the problems that they had. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are lost. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. It is written, that means in the Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the understanding of the perceiving ones. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the lawyer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, uh, for since in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom did not know God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. For the Jew uh, seeks, uh, asks for a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolish thing of God is wiser than men, and the weak things of God are stronger than men. For you see your calling, brothers, that not many wise men, according to the flesh, are called, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world and the things which are despised and of things which are not, in order to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that According as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now last week we were in Hebrews chapter 10. I think it was verses uh, 10 through 25 there. Uh, we're in our time. I sped it up at the end. So we're going to kind of start where we ended off. Uh, but we're in this different text. We had mentioned that the whole theme of Scripture was the gospel of the grace of God, in other words, Christ and Him crucified. We saw that this is our salvation, this is our glory, and our hope and assurance, Christ and Him crucified. That's where it's at. We said that it is our constant uh, determination here as a church body 
And, uh, you know, we glean this from the scripture. We, we learn from the scripture that this is what it should be. And, and we have warmed up to the idea. So we're engaged in that this is our determination. That we hold out that gospel of grace in Christ. And we're resolved to preach that and to teach it and to love it and to defend it. And to spread it as far as uh, we're given the grace to do that and uh, given the means to do that. And that uh, we concluded, uh, because of that, the effect of that on our lives, in our minds, we concluded that uh, we could say, it's not going out on a limb, we can say that, and, and use a common, maybe a, a street phrase, that we are into it. We're all about it. And I even kind of added the phrase that we should be uh, ate up with it. The hillbillies say you're plum ate up with it. And that's the idea. We, it, it, is, it has affected us in an, in an effectual way. That's being redundant in saying that. But it has changed our minds. And, it's, and since our minds are changed by the power of God, it changed our life once and for all in the way we think about who God is, who we are, and who Christ is. Does that mean that we are progressively become more perfect and that we don't think wrong sometimes? That, that doesn't mean that at all. This is the idea of the renewing of the mind of Scripture. It, it keeps us on this task and keeps our minds focused. Uh, and, you know, we're wishy-washy as sinful human beings. All more the reason to know our need to stay in the gospel and to fellowship with God's people because of our frailty. Now, we kind of concluded that we're into it because of the effect from God himself being into it. God's all about the gospel. He's all about the gospel because he, he invested himself in glorifying himself in the death of Christ, and it's the main thing in his mind in reference to his magnification of glory. There is nothing clearer, more magnified in reference to his glory than the cross of Christ. That's it. That's where it peaks out. This has been God's eternal idea throughout all eternity. So he's very protective of his glory here. He's jealous of his glory right here. And this is why we have to be very careful in particular about uh, promoting and defending. And, and the effect of that, of course, is us loving the character of God and how that the gospel was performed and how it's preserved in Scripture. And we are guardians of it and ambassadors of it as we hold it forth, as I said. We narrowed it down to the uh, central theme of the gospel, why it is actually the power of God into salvation. Romans 1, 16 and 17 talks about that, and it is because the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And uh, we know that this is concerns Christ establishing a perfect righteousness to meet that standard of God that matches and meets his character attribute of righteousness. And we know that this righteousness that he established was not his essential attribute that he turns over his attribute to us and imputes it to us. It is the merit that he gathered up through his establishing a righteousness, a gift package that is imputed or transferred legally to our account so that we may have it and be accepted according to that standard. So this is, this is what it is. And, and we see the Lord, our righteousness, as precious to us because what the law demanded, Christ provided, and we have it. And... Uh, this is what has reconciled us to God for our, we're justified now as a result of this. We are looked upon as perfect, just like the Father sees His Son, as naturally unbelievable as that is. Uh, you can't see that unless God gives you life to see that. So the, the cost, the merit that was accomplished by His obedience unto death uh, in an effectual, finished way, was done once and for all time. And, and there is security and assurance in that. We can, 
we can uh, we can lean on that. We can stand on that because it's actually done past tense. We don't we don't do anything to affect it, add to it, take away from it. And having laid all that out, we said that the gospel uh, must be preached and taught in a way in reference to the clarity of this righteousness that's demanded and provided for God's people. We, we preach it in such a way that we, we hold that specific part out and put that in the centerpiece that Christ alone is the one who did this. And therefore, we get our title of our message. He is the difference maker. That has to be there. And that what is that? Basically, synonymous with, that is synonymous with, this is the offense of the cross. That he alone is a difference maker, and you are not. Right? So this is what we always have to make clear. And, and when we, as we grow in this, we can detect a compromise of this a mile away. And this is what we need to, if you care about people, and you love them, and you have compassion and patience, you have to point these things out, and you have to say, okay, here's this famous preacher, this mainstream preacher that's got this gigantic crowd. What he's doing, he's shaving off the offense of the cross, these particular points where it says Christ is a difference maker, and he's leaving some space for, for a sinful human being to be a difference maker and to glory in that, making the difference, which implies the work was not finished. You're going to finish it by something you do. We can't have that. We can't have that. And, and being silent on that is, is not saying, well, we're not going to cause a ruckus, we're not, and we can't pat people uh, on, on their back and their false religion and say, well, we don't want to stir things up. You're okay. That's not love. Love says... Christ alone, you're out of it. So we have to make that distinction in the most loving, patient way that we can. We don't, we don't want to be hateful about it. We have to be clear and bold, but at the same time, uh, be humble and contend for the faith in patience, love, and compassion. It can be done. The scripture exhorts us to do it. It can be done. And we don't do it perfectly, right? We, we learn, and even in that, we learn how to do that. To uh, take this away, to take the offense of the cross away, and to take this, this what we're trying to prove in these two messages, that Christ alone is the difference maker, to take that away is to automatically create a false gospel. That's how you create a false gospel, is make Christ to not be the only difference maker. And that's to remove the offense of the cross. So we need to maintain a focus on this gospel to honor God's character. Uh, it, it's been brought up before. It's, it's awful weird. It's, 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 it's sad, if, if not funny, that we tend to defend all kinds of things. People in general do this. They'll defend maybe the character of their spouse, uh, their kids, even though their kids are mean as a snake. Um, maybe it's a sports team. I don't care what it is. Everybody has preferences about every. I've seen people argue about food where they're about ready to fight, you know, what food they like and hate. They'll defend all kinds of things. But it comes to the character of God. Oh, that's, that's no big deal. Uh, you have the right to believe that. You know, I respect your opinion. God doesn't respect it. You know, if they have that opinion, more than likely they've been sent uh, a strong delusion so that they may believe a lie. And it's our job to point the lie out. We looked a few weeks ago uh, in the message, uh, humbly contending for the faith. The text was in, uh, I believe, Second Timothy. It talked about that... Uh, the person that's dealing with the one that is lost must be patient and apt to teach because Satan uh, has taken them captive at his own will. They don't even know that they are deceived. They don't know that they're in the trap of self-righteousness. The worst thing that they can do, they think is the best thing that they're doing. They're going about to establish a righteousness of their own. 
So we have to come with the power of God, the dunamos, the dynamite of the gospel, and explode those self-righteous ideas. If they're not confronted about it, and again, in a loving way, because that's what that text talked about, we must be patient, apt to teach. Per adventure, God would grant them repentance to the believing of the truth. But these things, we can't, we can't brush them over, cover them up. Because, I mean, I've got, if we did that, I've, I've actually got better things to do than to do that on a Sunday every week, especially a Saturday cramming to study for these messages. I, I can think of all kinds of other things that my flesh would like to do, whether it be you know projects around the house or entertainment, but this is key right here. We must maintain the offense of the cross, not our offense, but the offense of the cross of Christ. It has to be there. You remove it, it's a false gospel. Then you have a ministry of death. I, I don't want to have a ministry of death. We send the warning out to people. So in the Hebrews text, what we looked at last week was, you don't have to go there, let me just hit it real quick. We looked at the old covenant law. You know, the, the Hebrews book was written to Hebrews Christians, warning them, don't go back to the old covenant. We saw, first of all, that the law was not a tool for salvation. We know the law was given to show that you can't keep it. Shows God's standard, which uh, more particularly is Christ, uh, the one who uh, honored the law, magnified the law, and satisfied the law. But we saw that the law, the law wouldn't work there because uh, people, their nature, they couldn't do it. So, the law was not the difference maker. We saw, after the law can't do it, what do you need? You need a sacrifice. So, we saw that the blood of animals could not do it. It said that the blood of bulls and goats and heifers, whatever the animals they named, said could never take away sin. So, this other thing that, was fall, that, was, that they fell back on since they couldn't keep the law, now they're sat they through well made the sacrifices were cut. No. Sacrifices could not do the sacrifices of animals was not the difference maker. So then we focused on the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ that satisfied God's wrath for the elect once and for all time, and then he sat down. And we started to see that that seating the exaltation of Christ in the highest position and that sitting down signified that he finished the work and that it was gladly accepted by the Father as a suitable sacrifice, a sweet-smelling savor to the nostrils in reference to the demands of God being, being satisfied uh, by the Father of Christ. And Christ then was displayed in his exaltation as the one making the only difference as he was surety for the elect. So we need to always reemphasize this. We're always talking about it. That Christ is not just the difference maker in initial salvation. I think sometimes people get that in their heads. We need to constantly work to debrief ourselves and undo maybe prior programming of thinking that like all right we're saved and then we put that aside i'm going to talk some more things about the utilization of the gospel later here in a minute but we have talked about the involvement of christ tied to the father in election before time and then of course christ tied to the spirit after regeneration and conversion in our walk of faith and then all the way up to glorification. We've talked about what that's going to look like. We, we look and we see the worship of people laying uh, prostrate and worshiping him, the lamb worthy. But all along it's about the lamb of God all the way through. Um, let's be reminded that the Father, it, it is seen that the Father has set Christ forth in preeminence in all things. We have a banner in the back that said that in all things he might have preeminence. Colossians 1.18. And we know that includes 
a lot of things, you know, um, creation, um, providence, um, judgment. He, he's assigned to be the judge in the end. But going back to talking about salvation, before time, in time, and after time, we know that uh, the Father has set Christ forth especially in salvation. And as we are going through our election series, Chosen in Christ, I think we're going to go, it's part 17 pretty soon, but we, we looked clearly at this, how that when the Father chose, in our introductory message we made sure we wanted to see that Christ is preeminent in this uh, series, that, yeah, the Father's sovereign. A lot of people, that's all they look at and they drop it. Christ is preeminent in election. The elect were chosen in Christ, in, by, and through. The manner in which they were chosen by the Father was in Christ. So Christ has the preeminence in election. That's the wisdom of the Father. So they were um, set apart in Christ, loved in Christ, elected in Christ, their mediator, substitute, and representative. And this one is not just Lord and Savior and mediator. He is the Christ of God. He is, of course, God himself. He's the god made mediator, but he's the Christ of God. He's God's mediator. God cannot approach us unless he has Christ as a mediator. We have a mediator so we can deal with God, but God must have a mediator to deal with us. So he's the Christ of God, and he is God's mediator, the Father's mediator. Same with the work of Spirit on the other end. Uh, we know the work of the Spirit could only be done on the ground of the work of Christ, Christ crucified. We know that the Spirit testifies of this, this point, and he testifies of Christ in the main. He doesn't, he says he doesn't test, the scripture says he does not testify himself. He will not testify of himself. He testifies of Christ. That's his task, and he likes it. The Holy Spirit enjoys testifying of the one that the Father set, set out front in preeminence. Christ is the preeminent one. Now, last week we ended up our message talking about the unity of the church. Uh, you can imagine that area, that section there where it talks about um, Hebrews 10, 23, 24, 25 there. It talks about what the church should be doing as these things were laid out about how that we are secure and that we are assured we are to approach the throne with boldness. And now it's talking, uh, there in that last part we looked at, it was talking about as the church gathers, because the world is against us, the church gathers for encouragement to feed on Christ, and it talked about unity and love in this common goal of meeting together and the importance of meeting together as time goes on, even as we see the day approaching, because the world is wicked. And we need, uh, because of our weakness, we need communion and fellowship. So we, we ended up talking about unity, the importance of unity. So that's where we're going to begin uh, this week. And let's go up a little further in our context. Let's go to verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1. And uh, I'm not going to read all the way to verse 1, but you remember the context of some of these people were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And they, were, they had preacher favorites and they had ministry favorites. And I mean, I can only imagine some of the things people were talking about of why they chose this person over this person. And Paul's pretty much writing to them and saying, look, hey, we've, we've all got the same gospel. We might have different personalities and different ways of communicating, uh, but we have the same gospel. And you people are causing disunity in this idea, You're causing divisions by acting this way. Verse 10 says, But I exhort you, brothers. Again, he's talking to brothers. These are people that are saints, they've been justified, they've been born again, even though they had all these problems. So he's talking to the brothers and sisters in Christ that are at the church of Corinth. He says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is the authority upon which he's exhorting them. Notice this, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no 
divisions, it kind of matches, doesn't it, among you. And that, here's some more language, it's redundant. And that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment, uh, discernment, understanding, and making judgments by that discernment. That's the idea there. So God's people are to seek unity, primarily for the glory of God. And for Christ's sake alone, so that the church of Christ is not blasphemed. The truth and the glory of God is more important than we are. So we must sacrifice our little pet ideas, our little preferences, secondary issues. And we must, as, it, as, as we've seen in uh, Philippians 2, look upon and care upon the things of others rather than ourselves. Put people ahead of us, whether they be stronger than us or weaker than us, it does not matter. For the sake of the unity of the church and the glory of God, we are to do this unity in all things, specifically the gospel, and that's what drives us in our unity. Because as we looked at a few weeks ago, we have a common salvation. We have the same salvation in common. And all this, this whole idea, it opposes uh, division, pride, and human preeminence. We, we saw an example of human preeminence. Paul named uh, the uh, Diotrephes. And um, this was a person, he had a bad report. He named a, the other guy, was it Demetrius, I think, that had the good report. He showed these two contrasts. He said, <laughs> don't be like that guy. <laughs> This is bad. This is bad for everything. It's bad for the church. And um, he warned him about this, this diatrophies that desired preeminence. Uh, that, that's a stealing away of the preeminence of Christ. And it is adding to this disunity in the church. So these things oppose God's truth. Verse 11, it says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brothers, by those of Cleo, that there are contentions among you. Now, God has stated throughout his word that he hates pride. And he warns about division. And our text is showing a warning about division, especially in God's church. Contentions means quarrel, wrangling, uh, strife, variance, and uh, debate, and I believe, of course, debate here is in a, in a negative sense. Uh, there is debate in a, in a positive sense, in a reasoning, and a uh, critical thinking, and, and iron sharpening iron in, in a positive direction. We're not afraid of that. Uh, we promote that. It's just pretty much think, it's thinking is what it is. But here it's talking about uh, debate uh, in a quarrelsome, uh, you know, contentious way. Uh, probably for the sake of the sport of debate. It has to do with uh, pride in this case. So there's a warning there. And, and this can come in a, in a multiplicity of ways. And sometimes, but not always, is related to immaturity. But it could be immaturity, pride, preeminence, malice. It could be issues of culture, class, race, politics, uh, secondary issues, uh, could be part of the problem of division. Uh, we know doctrinally there are things that uh, we think we might know a lot of, maybe even more than other people, but we can't look at these things and bring them in and say, this is a salvation issue. And be proud that, okay, I'm the go-to guy on this. I know a lot about this. And uh, somebody maybe on social media might say, well, go ask, go ask him. He knows a lot about that. And then you get on your hobby horse and you boom, boom, boom. Causes division. Causes division. You have to put those things on the back burner. Study them yourself. Learn from them. But... Unity in the gospel of Christ. There's enough, there's enough material 
to clarify and learn and grow in the gospel of Christ and the doctrines that surround and are associated with salvation and the person of Christ and, and uh, the attributes of God, the character of God, all these things that have to do with salvation and Christ and the gospel. There's a plenty there to study for more lifetimes than you can live, even if you are a cat. There are. Simmer down. Identify what is a secondary issue. Swallow your pride. Get on board with what God says to do in the church. And we know that in doing this, we know good and well that the gospel itself is the tool to utilize to do this. And we grow in the gospel. And this is what I was referring to earlier. We don't believe the gospel and say, okay, now we're setting aside the gospel and we're going to look at things separately from the gospel, whether it be ethics or morality or um, marriage or the way the church is run. Everything must be funneled through and filtered to the gospel of grace as, as we said, a hermeneutical to, tool to interpret everything else. Everything is interpreted through the gospel of the grace of God in Christ. So we grow in that and we, we keep that gospel as a tool to discern everything. I believe that's what our text is talking about. Being in the same mind, in the same judgment to discern things through the gospel of Christ. And there is a sense in which, of course, as we are exercised in the gospel, that we, of course, we're called disciples. And we, we want to disciple others. And that word disciple has to do with being disciplined in this gospel. We could talk about church discipline. Church discipline is not, hey, I heard you did this. Come up before the church. We're going to spank you in public. Discipline has to do with the Word of God. Feeding that person the Word of God and showing what the Word of God says to do about things. Not making some open spectacle about like, hey, we're, we're so righteous here. We're spanking people in public. See, we do church discipline. It's the Word of God that does the discipline primarily. And it's, and it's our job, not just as my job, but everyone in here to get on board with this idea and encourage one another in the Scriptures through the Gospel primarily. The gospel disciplines us positively first. And then, of course, there's some things that it rubs that seem negative at the time, but it's still positive. You think of a, a, a fitness person, one that is maybe into sports or this, that, and the other. You, I'm sure all of you have tried different diets. What is the key? Discipline, right? You're into it. You look at a guy that, uh, um, like me, <laughs> has uh, flirted around with working out, you know, and every year think, man, I should look like this or feel like this by now. How come I am not by now? There's one answer. It's discipline. I don't have any, right? I might know. I might know all about it. I might be able to teach it. But if I don't have the discipline to do it, uh, it's not much good. I might be able to make money telling other people. I'm not practicing what I preach, but I can tell other people what to do. But the discipline, and this is the same in a gospel context. You can, you can have a PhD, you can be an author, you can be famous. And then something you hold in your own mind, as you apply it in your own life, might be all crooked. It might not be, it might not fit. It's like, like we said a few weeks ago, uh, and I've done it, putting a piece of puzzles together and um, <laughs> you've got some, you're going to force that in there. You're going to cram it in there and the edges are curled up. It doesn't fit, but you're undisciplined in your thinking and you think, I don't care, I'm going to make that fit anyway. No, submit to the scripture, to the word of God, what he says, and we're disciplined through that. And then once we, you know, we're, we're made to accept that, we warm up to the idea, like, why in the world did I ever think that weird thing before? God has corrected me in his word, and our minds are renewed that way. So the gospel is an ongoing tool that we utilize. We don't lay it aside. 
The gospel is a means in our minds. This, this thing of Christianity is about the mind. Nothing more. It's about our, if we, I don't care what you do with your body. If you don't use your mind to do what you're doing with your body, uh, you're not really doing it. It's like, it's robotish. Uh, we have an understanding. God's given us an understanding in our mind of the things that we know and believe and, and do. He said that. And this is uh, the way we, we operate by faith. Creation of the world, for example. Uh, Hebrews 11 says, By faith we understand how the worlds were framed. It didn't just say, By faith uh, we know the worlds were framed. We understand. If you understand how that this God can take you the way you are and save you, I'm going to understand how the world is framed. <laughs> Because the miraculous thing that he has done, he has saved me. The world is going to be easy for him to create out of nothing. Because I was nothing. And God justified me. And now I am precious to him based on Christ. The world, creating the world is going to be a breeze. All he did was speak that into existence by his character attributes of power and so on. To save me. Son of God had to die. It took a little bit more effort than speaking things into existence. So we have an understanding. We're given an understanding. And if we don't understand things like we want to, get in this word and study it. And he'll and you ask for wisdom, and he will give it to you. He said that he would. Now this gospel, um, some of the things that he utilize that we can utilize for it to do. Um, we know that the gospel teaches us how to judge saved and lost, starting with ourselves. Starting with ourselves. And this is how we check our calling and election and make sure we're of the faith. The gospel teaches, uh, and, and we, I could do a message on each one of these, but I'm just going to give some bullet points of, of the tool of the gospel, how it's used, and what the scripture shows that it's used for. The gospel shows us how to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because mainly, it shows how that we were loved for Christ's sake. And that's how we love others. The gospel teaches us how to forgive one another because we were forgiven for Christ's sake. So we, we should utilize that gospel to issue out gospel forgiveness to people that are brothers and sisters in Christ. The gospel teaches us where we actually stand in Christ and shows us that if we were outside of Christ where we would stand, we would not stand. So the gospel, as we are disciplined in it and we're reminded why we stand where we're at and we're warned to take heed where we stand lest we fall because pride sets us up to fall if we're looking in the wrong place, if we're looking in rather than looking to Christ. So the gospel teaches us that. The gospel teaches us mainly, connected to these two messages that we're doing, is who makes us to differ. Why do we, who makes you to differ? Why would you boast about something you didn't have and uh, something that you received that came from an outside source, God giving it to you? Why, why are you having a tendency to do that? Paul said that uh, in Corinthians, one of the, I don't remember the reference, but, brings us to our point of the message. God makes us to differ, and it's in Christ who is the difference maker. It's the whole point of this idea, to be reminded of that. So the gospel does all these things and more, and this is what it is basically live by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, not just at the beginning, but all the way through. And the gospel is part and parcel of that. And this is what it is to uh, walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, by having this mindset that God gives us the mind of Christ. You know, Christ said um, to his disciples, he said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Um, later on in the text that David uh, read, I think it was verse 23, it says, talking about... Um, 
that we have um, our hope is in Christ. And this gospel shows us this. And it says, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, it's referring to perseverance in the gospel. It's not talking about these increased, necessarily increased and progressive works that get better and better and more perfect. And in the end, you reach some perfection to where you need Christ less and less and you sin less and less. Perseverance in the truth of the gospel that says that's already been taken care of by Christ. And we do good works based on the fact that it's already been taken care of. So it's a matter of focus and what is the central theme. And then we serve, of course, uh, not with dead works, but for a new motive of love and thankfulness. So we're discipled in this. We're disciplined in the gospel. And we continue in that. The same book of Hebrews, remember? Uh, I think it's last week, chapter 10. I think it's at the end of, uh, I don't know, chapter 10 or 11. We are not of those that draw back into perdition, but we are those that believe to the saving of the soul. We don't go back into some apostasy idea and try to bring back being accepted by doing the law and establishing some righteousness because there remains no more sacrifice for sin than this one right here because he's the only one that made the difference. So this continued belief of the truth and love of the truth of the gospel is the evidence of salvation. Now let's go down to verse 17. I want to pick some things up. We're quickly running out of time. Verse 17, and we'll look at a few things here as we go. For or because Christ did not send me to baptize. Let me just stop there a second. Now, Paul, he's setting some up here. He wants you to see something. Um, baptism is, a, is a, not a primary issue like the gospel is. There's, there's, baptism is a gigantic subject. And Paul here is saying that baptism is not my priority. And these people were acting kind of weird anyway. And he was, he was giving them warnings and exhortations about the way that they were acting by the things that they were doing in these divisions. And, um, you know, in our church, when we, when we do a baptism, uh, we, we talk about um, uh, identity with Christ and identity with the church body who is identified with Christ. And we talk about uh, a divorce from the world because the world uh, hates us. We're, we're crucified to the world in our ideas about the glory of the cross. So many things in reference to an identity. We covered some of that in the election series about how that, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. So we come to know Christ and then we don't want to know the ideas of the world and we, we dismiss those things. In our minds, when we hear the world's counsel, we, in our mind, hopefully are disciplined enough to say, depart from me, you wicked idea. I never, even though we did before, but we want to cast them off like we never knew them. And I think maybe Paul here is, in reference to this baptism thing, is because when you make a profession, and I know there's different uh, in, in some different groups, there's different uh, means and modes of baptism at different times, and uh, which, I'm, of course, I'm not, uh, because I want unity, I'm not going to debate that here. But when one makes, in our church, when they make a confession of Christ or profession of Christ, it's like they're making a mark, like I'm making a stand, I'm making an announcement. And then if something happens after that, doesn't seem to make any difference what they said then when they did that. Um, I mean, as I was preparing for this message, I saw this. I'm thinking, there's, uh, I, I can count, I can count a certain amount of people that I have baptized since I've been converted that seem to have left the faith, and um, so. I don't have a tendency to brag about baptisms. I know some churches, you know, it's, how many did you baptize this week? 
you know. Hey, I'm just concerned who's persevering in the gospel. That's what I want to talk about. Because this thing is, is merely based on what somebody said at one time. Where are you at now? What are you holding to right now? So Paul, he says, he didn't send me to baptize. And he, he names two that he did, except for maybe these two people, you know. But he said, but... God sent me to preach the gospel. And even in that, it's not in wisdom of words. And here, just let me give you some commentary as I flow through here, like perhaps a, a contemporary amplified version. And this is what I do when I preach anyway, so I'm not butchering this text when I say this. But to preach the gospel, not in wisdom of words, because if I did, the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. The idea is you void it out. It's just like the text in uh, Romans 11, 5 and 6. Even at this time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. You have voided it out. It is now of none effect because of what you did to butcher it to pervert it. The, the truth is not of a lie. But you have perverted it and you have poisoned it with your lie. And that's what, that's what Paul here says. He talks about the wisdom of words. And the wisdom of words we're going to see here in the text is talking about, of course, a false... It, it's got to be tied to a false gospel. The wisdom of God has purpose to glorify himself in the death of Christ and the salvation of the elect takes place in that, in that process. He's determined from all eternity to glorify himself in the death of Christ. Now, natural man, the, the mankind that is dead in their trespasses and sins, that is a, of a carnal mind, that is in need of the new birth, in need of justification, natural man could never, ever, even dream up a salvation that comes close to what God has eternally purposed in his wisdom, in his knowledge. We know what man automatically does. It's a default position that man naturally falls into. It's on him himself, man. It is man's doing, man's credit, and man's glory and boast as a result. It's automatic. Nobody ever has been born with a different mindset than that. It's automatic. This way of salvation by grace alone that also, and this is the part that's rarely talked about. Salvation by grace alone through Christ alone. Him being the difference maker. That would enable God to be both a just God and a savior. He not only saves man by grace, but he does it in such a way that he himself is faithful to his own character. And he gets this job done in such a unique, wise way that he does it without contaminating his holy hands. The question is asked, how can man be just with God? And the question should also be asked, how can God be just and justify the ungodly? Now, that is a Godward-focused question, and we are accountable to God to worship him, so we should be concerned, and I know as people we're always concerned about ourselves first, and, and we do have a salvation by grace, and we see that, but we should ponder more often whenever we think about it or see it in the Scripture or we're reminded of each other that this thing is about Him. The sacrifice of Christ was to the Father. The Father had to be satisfied. God set it up in such a way that He needed to be satisfied. It had to be done in a just way. So we see false gospels destroy these things, pervert his justice, his righteousness, his holiness, 
is faithfulness. This is key. This is part of what's tied to what the offense of the cross is because uh, we can say, we can say, biblically, there are things that God cannot do. You know, some people say, uh, God is um, all-powerful and He's all this and all this and He can do anything. Well, He has stated Himself. And I think He is happy to say so because He said it. That's why. <laughs> he said... Uh, Talked about the God that cannot lie. Uh, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God, uh, those that are justified. God can't. It's not that he won't. He can't because of who he is. We could talk about the impeccability of Christ. Could Christ have sinned? We say, biblically, that he could not have because of who he is. We can talk like that about God and, and glorify God in a process. And I think uh, God is happy to hear us recognize things that he's already communicated to us about who he is and how he operates. And that people, if that rubs people the wrong way, they're not, they're not thinking past the end of their nose. Seriously. This is, these things, I think, are easy to see. and we can, They have depth to them. We can go far into them. But the, the essence of them uh, are, are true, and, and they should lend to our confidence in who He is and how that things are fixed in God's mind because of His character. We can lay hold of them, be sure and certain. It can be an anchor. Of course, we know in the Gospel that Christ, uh, this, this was done so that God could justify the ungodly and remain holy and clean himself and be faithful to his character through the means of uh, the virgin birth of Christ to bypass uh, the sin of Adam and this uh, perfect person who in both two natures, a divine nature, the eternal Son of God, and his divinity was um, took on flesh, perfect human sinless flesh, to be the spotless lamb of God, sinless nature. He was born of a woman, born under the law, to keep it, fulfill it, and every jot and tittle. He promised it would happen. He could do nothing but that because of who he was. He was impeccable. And he fulfilled that law, and then he mounted the cross, and he satisfied the law. And the means by which this was done, so that his person and his nature was not affected uh, or, or infected was through the means of both affected and infected. He was not. Because the means of imputation or the legal transfer of sin to his account, sin was put on him. Sin was not put in him. Sin was not infused into him to affect his nature in a negative way to make him no longer the spotless lamb. He was a perfect sacrifice. He had to remain a perfect sacrifice. And he had sins of someone else on his account. And it was a temporary basis until he took care of that and removed it for specific sacrificial purposes of accomplishing redemption. So he legally became liable and accountable for the sins of someone else. This is through, again, the means of Imputation, so that he could pay the penalty. There was a penalty and a curse against God's people. He was in union with God's people and loved them in such a way that he took care of this demand from God to them and this debt that they owed to God. And this is called, of course, propitiation. He satisfied those demands by his bloody death and meritorious satisfactory sacrifice. It's propitiation. That's what that word means. Don't be afraid of it. Satisfaction. So what that did, of course, is it merited and established a perfect righteousness. That was what was demanded, and that's the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. And that righteousness is to be charged to, in a positive way, imputed or transferred legally to the account of all 
God's people. And that's just called the gift of righteousness in Romans 5. The gift of righteousness by the obedience of one, Christ the representative. And in that way, that way that it's done, it's done in such a way that it enables God. God could not do it any other way. It enables God to be both a just God and a Savior, to be just when he justifies the ungodly, making him faithful to his character. So we look at Christ and we see he is the difference maker, and we see that in some of his names, that he is the Lord our righteousness. That's his name. There's salvation in his name. That's one of them. He didn't change up his name. He doesn't allow people to change his name. That he is the Lord partially our righteousness. Or he is the Lord some of our righteousness. He is the Lord. It's, it's spelled out in the Old Testament all caps. That's his name. He's jealous of his own self and character. Don't use his name in vain. This is his name. The Lord our righteousness. And uh, he means it. His names have specific definitions that fit his purposes shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's who he is. Don't use his name in vain. Now, foolish man, that's the natural man, who's a natural fool, could not ever come up with this wise way, again, uh, to be justified in the eyes of God's law and justice. Could not do it. There's no possible way. Look at verse 18. For the preaching of the cross, here it is, is foolishness to those who perish. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. In other words, unto salvation. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. So, I'm just going to give, I'm running out of time. Give us brief commentary as we go through here. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Now, this is, this is their perceived own wisdom, of course. Can we read this in the sense of the text and understand it as we go along? Uh, there's some things in this first chapter that, you know, I, I would love to do about a hundred part series against mysticism. It's not my purpose here today. My purpose here today is to show Christ as the difference maker. Uh, you don't understand how tempting it is to want to just explode, just camp out here and explode mysticism. Just try to remember all the things I've ever said about it over the past however many years and infuse it in your brain when I'm reading this other stuff. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the perceived wisdom that you think they have, and I will set aside the understanding of the perceiving ones, those that think they perceive, those that think they understand. God's going to frustrate them with his wisdom. And he's saying, you know, where are they? Uh, it's just like pretty much, it's a taunting thing, I think, which I enjoy. Um, they're not squat. <laughs> they're, they're, they're no body. Scripture says about us, collectively, anyway, we're less than nothing. Man at his best is altogether vanity. That's just total depravity, basic 101, total depravity. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the lawyer of this world? The 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 one that spits out his rhetoric foolishly that doesn't match the gospel or the glory of God. Man's philosophy, man's logic as opposed to God's philosophy and God's logic. Where is he? Where are they at? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And we can be confident that this has taken place because of where we were and where we came from. We know, looking back, that's what we used to be in that category. For since in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom that they thought they had did not know God in, in a saving way, a glorifying way, it pleased God. This just is pregnant with sovereignty. It pleased God sovereignly by the foolishness of preaching what they thought was foolishness, but is the power of God, to save those who actually believe this wisdom of God, the truth of the gospel. Verse 22 gives an example 
of, of the two categories of peoples in the world, uh, Jews and Gentiles. And they, and they both had different things they were holding in their head to different degrees. And this is like sort of a general idea. Uh, the Jews um, asked for a sign. We see examples of that in the, in the Gospels. Uh, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And this is, he, Paul's identifying with those that have the same salvation he does, the same Savior, believe the same Gospel. We preach Christ and Him crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. Remember that, that Christ has been made that chief cornerstone, the one that we, we love and know, and we stand on that foundation, the solid rock. But it's a stumbling stone. They trip over it. And to the Greeks, foolishness, because the Greeks had all their Greek philosophy, and they thought they were wise in themselves, and so on and so forth. But to them, the called out ones, those that are called, talking about believers, both Jews and Greeks, because those are elect from Jews and Gentiles, those that believe Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's who he is already, and that's who he is now to us because we've been given an understanding and eyes of faith to see and the Spirit of God been born again to see this. Because the foolish, the foolish thing of God is wiser than men and the, the weak thing of God is stronger than men. This is just comparative language. Uh, God really technically, in essence, doesn't have anything weak. Everything he has is strong. Even if he uses something that's outside of him, that's considered weak, when it's used, it is strong. Because God uses it on purpose, in his providence, and his sovereignty. And it's effective. So it doesn't matter how weak it's perceived, with God it's going to work. We can, we can be rest assured of that. 26, it says, For you see your calling, brothers, not many wise, according to the flesh, are called, and not many mighty, not many mobile, uh, noble. And you know, you know how we naturally think. We, you see it on, for example, T Trinity Broadcasting Network and Christian Broadcasting Network, and these different religious networks. They recruit famous people so that people can look at the fame of the people and say, "Hey." That famous person is a Christian. That's not so bad. Maybe I can be one too because he's so aspiring to be like. It's kind of divorced from who Christ actually is because most of those people, they don't believe the gospel anyway. If they did, uh, we would know about it. And they would be being persecuted for what they actually believe rather than being lifted up on a pedestal and it being all about them. You see what I'm saying? So, the wisdom of man wants to always offset things so Christ is not the central focus. Uh, maybe we might save stories and talk about, hey, this one famous person, um, it, even if it's a famous preacher. You know, if we make a dogmatic statement about the gospel that's, that's narrow as the scripture states it, and somebody says, hey, this famous Sovereign Grace Calvinist Reform person over here never said that as if he trumps scripture or something. And people will lean on his fame. Well, he's, he's authored, he's published, he's got letters, he's widely accepted, he's a conference speaker. He doesn't say that. Who are you in this? How many people do you have? How can you say? And, and we just, we try to honor God by what God says. Maybe these others are afraid because they're ashamed of the gospel. They're afraid of persecution. Afraid of losing money. Losing a following. It happens all the time. That's what compromise is all about. It's one of those things. So the, the mighty noble things, the wise according to the, that's that's not 
very often happens. It says, doesn't say not any, it just says not many. It's just the way God operates. He operates the opposite of the way we would do it, right? If we had a festival here, I don't even care, it has to do anything with the church. If we had a festival, say we're trying to raise money for, um, say somebody was in a, a car rack and we're trying to raise money. Well, if, if I could get a famous guy in here, nationally or world famous, you know how many in the community would show up? You know how much money we'd get? We'd get a lot. But if it's just, you know, a bunch of nobodies saying, hey, this guy wrecked, he needs money, you wouldn't probably get very much. You'd have some people that just, you know, are compassionate, they get money, whether they're believers or not. But you know the idea that you get famous, powerful, wise people and you get this thing going. That's what a mega church is all about. It's entertainment. It's, it's everything but Christ and Him crucified. That's why we should read this and be comfortable with being determined not to know anything among anybody except Christ and Him crucified. Cut to the chase. Go for the juggler. Go for the difference maker. Christ alone. Screw everything else. If I can say it that way. I think you know what I mean. But God has, verse 27, used the, uh, chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, or at least perceived mighty. And God's chosen the base things of the world, the, the low things. And the things that are despised... He's piling on the negativity here of what the world perceives. Things that are despised and the things which are not in order to bring to nothing the things that are, the things that are perceived to be something. And there's a reason for this. We've been hinting at it. And this is the reason. So that. In other words, this is the reason. So that. No flesh should glory in his presence. Paul in Philippians 3 talked about an evidence of a believer. And one of those evidences is that he has no confidence in the flesh. Someone that has confidence in the flesh is one who is walking in the flesh as opposed to those walking in the spirit. Very simple. I mean, we know that here. We've been over and over. So, and here we come. Uh, of course, we're like way overdue on the time. And here's the meat of it. Brought us to this text. To see this in this verse. I'm going to identify the characters as we go through here. So we see we're left off with that verse. No flesh. This is the reason all this is done. So that no flesh should glory. We know that some try, and even listed some attempts here of what Jews seek after sign, and uh, the Gentiles, they talk about wisdom, the Greeks. So here's an idea that's opposed to that, but, uh, counterwise, here's the, here, here's the truth of the matter. But of him, of God the Father, you speaking of believers, those that he was writing to, which we can apply this to us, because we're believers of common salvation with the church at Corinth. But of the Father, you, believers, are in Christ, who, speaking of being in Christ, are of God the Father, that Christ, who of God, Christ, is made unto us, Christ is made unto us these things. Catch that phrase. He is made unto us these things. And this is done by the Father. What are the things that Christ is made unto us? I did a series on these, uh, each separate one, a separate uh, message per word here. And um, I didn't go back and re review it, but I think I, I kind of leaned on this idea and focused on the fact that Christ is made unto us these things representatively. And in reference to our state and standing in Christ, we are these things because God has made Christ 
unto us these things. Wisdom. I mean, that's all he's been talking about here those last uh, so many verses. Christ has made unto us wisdom. The requirement of wisdom that the Father required of us. We are in Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We look on the gospel now that's the power of God and the salvation. And we, uh, again, uh, we see that Christ is that essence. He is the difference maker. We've received the offense of the cross. We love the offense of the cross. It's not an offense anymore. The cross was a mystery to us. But it's not a mystery anymore. We no longer hate him. We've been reconciled to him. We love him. All these things go together. They all go together. And God looks upon us as being the wisdom of God in Christ. We agree with the truth. We see that all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. And that's what we do. We confess Him. What's it mean to confess Him? We say the same word about Him that God does. We agree. In that sense, we have entered into the covenant. We agree with the terms and conditions and the promises of the covenant that it's all salvation condition on Christ alone. I mean, this is, this is protective for us. You know, we gladly embrace this. We now see that this is the only way. This is the best way. It's not that there are other options. We know when we say best, we refer to wisdom. The, the, the all-wise God, eternal, powerful God, sovereignly purposed to do this in this way. And we, again, go, I go back to the phrase, we're into it. Before, your ways are not my ways, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Now we are conformed to those ideas. And, and it's more that we renew our minds, we're into it even more. And conformed to, we're on board more and more and more. If we're disciplined in the word, by and through the gospel, to see these things. So he's made unto us the wisdom of God. Righteousness is what the gospel is all about. We always talk about it. We know 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Christ was made sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I mean, those things are so neatly put together in harmony. Many were made righteous, Romans 5, by the obedience of one. We don't look to our flesh and make any claims. There's warnings about that. The verse before this warns about that. The verse after this warns about that. But we are made Christ has made unto us these things. He is our right. That's his name. And then, as we are married to him, the bride of Christ, we take on his name. The church is called the Lord our righteousness. We can't glory in us having anything to do with that, but yet we glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for accomplishing that. So that is a righteousness outside of us that's given to us on our account. We don't have a personal righteousness that we established. He is our sanctification. He's made unto us sanctification. He, is, he has set us apart, make us holy. He has consecrated us in three different ways, at least. Love and election. The Father set us apart in Christ. Really, once and for all time when He did that. And He did that eternally. So in other words, he has always done that in his mind. So he sets us apart eternally in Christ. We're set apart, sanctified. And again, it's in Christ, the manner in which it was done, in, by, and through. And of course, the blood of Christ, we saw last week, that sacrifice. It, we're sanctified once and for all, perfected forever, those that are sanctified by the, by the cross. Seems to be the easiest to see, and then upon that ground, on that basis, the Spirit is is uh, works off of that ground because of the work of Christ for us. The Spirit can work in us off of that ground, and we are uh, in our own in time in our experience. We see 
through the word, what the word of God says, that we are sanctified in the spirit or by the spirit. We're set apart in, in um, the spirit, giving us life, regenerating us, setting us apart, giving us a new mind, a new heart. And we are actually sanctified. And we can also say, in all three aspects of Trinitarian sanctification, we can say once and for all time in all those. Um, so no matter what happens in reference to, uh, especially in the spirit of, of, of how supposedly we do, quote unquote, it may, it may look good some days, it may not look good some days. You know, it, it, what it is, it's, it's constant rather than progressive. It's there, it's done. It's once and for all. We can never, in other words, this is a simple part. We can never be unsanctified. As many problems as this church had, the church of Corinth, they were always called saints. They were believers. They were saints from day one. It wasn't like, uh, you know, we'll have to, uh, like some churches that are, um, have a, maybe a, a board of people where after you die, they can bring you in in reference to, we're going to vote and see if you are a saint. And we can officially say you were a saint. No. These people, with all their, with all their uh, you know, spiritual warts, as we can say, they had all kinds of problems. They were saints. They were sanctified in a Trinitarian fashion. And they had, ex- they had experienced the new birth. And the Spirit of God was working in them. And Paul's here to lend to that with biblical discipline in giving the gospel in its context. He's determined not to know anything. That's what he said to these people. Except for Christ, crucif- uh, Christ and Him crucified. And that was, that was the means by which the Spirit used to straighten these people out. Some uh, perhaps were excommunicated. Um, but the Spirit of God through the means of the Word of God and renewing people's minds through the Gospel was the, the work and the means that effectively um, feeds people to cause them to um, when, when God, He works both in them to do and to will His good pleasure. He uses the uh, means of the Word of God to do that. It's just not done in a vacuum. There's an understanding that takes place. So there is a sanctification that he has made unto us. Christ is our sanctification. He's all these things to us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and lastly, redemption. He's our redemption. He's he's not just our redeemer. He is our redemption. And he's made unto us redemption. We are bought by him. We are his and He is ours. We are one with Him. Just like Christ in John 17 prayed that prayer that, that Father, these that You gave me, that they would be one. Even as I am in You and You in me, I pray that they be one with us. And we know there's a legal union that cannot ever be separated. That He's made unto us these things. And this is the, 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 the state in the position where we stand that is unchangeable. And we, this is, this is now in our mind because of what God says with His truth. We embrace this in our mind by faith. And these are the things that in the end, it doesn't matter how much ruckus in the world that takes place. In, in Hebrews, it talks about, I believe it's in chapter 12 or so, Somewhere around here, maybe 13, it talks about in the end when, uh, you know, how before, how he spoke from heaven and he shook the earth. In the end, he's going to shake, he's going to shout, he's going to shake both heaven and earth. And everything's going to be destroyed and removed. There's only be the only spiritual things, eternal things, things you can't see will remain. And this is exactly what we're talking about. This is what will remain. Our faith in this one that we can't see, we're told where he's at. We believe where he's at. We understand where he's at. We understand why he's there. This is the part that's unshakable. I mean, you, you can't, it's not like I got a religious trinket. When you take that away, oh man, there went my whole world. You know? <laughs> you can't, first of all, most people don't even understand what we believe to try to take it away. If we went before some tribunal, uh, you can't take away 
what I know, because most people that would want to do that to me don't even know it. That's not bragging, that's a fact. That They're crucified to us, us and them, they don't even want to know what we, the intricate details of, of what we glory in. Most, most, <laughs> historically most trials and things like that were trumped up charges and lies anyway. I mean, they, they, conspir- they conspired against Christ to do that, or did the same thing to us. It's fake news, in other words, even in a spiritual sense. I broke a record. I'm going to stop. Broke a record on the time. Any comments or questions? Questions or comments? Uh, Let me read that last verse just to cap it off. We're made unto him all these things so that, another so that, verse before and verse after, according as is written in the Old Testament, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now there's a redundancy about glorying. It's all over the place. And this is another clear one. And it's, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because... He is the difference maker. I can't, you know, I'm going to try to use as many uh, synonyms as possible over the years to continue to say the same thing from a different angle because of the different twinkling facets of the gospel that, that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in. Yes? The simplicity that's in Christ. Right. Let me remind you of. Uh, after I say this, you'll probably remember the simplicity that is in Christ. It's in First uh, uh, or Second Corinthians um, eleven. Paul in the contest was talking about, he, he was worried about some of the church. Um, he was jealous of them with a godly jealousy because he was afraid that they would be deceived with the uh, subtlety of Satan who would distract them from the simplicity which is in Christ. And then after that he talks about another Christ, another gospel, powered by another spirit. And he says, you know, th- these people are bringing these other messages in and for whatever reason, you're listening to them. And I don't get it, because I'm the one that preached the gospel to you. And I'm, I don't want you to be moved away from it, so I have a godly jealousy. And when he says simplicity there, he's talking about that word refers to the singleness as compared to double. We know the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that's why we uh, emphasize the title of the message, Christ the Difference Maker. It's not, he doesn't share the difference making. He is and we are. It's not Christ plus. It's not Christ minus. It's Christ alone. And we're serious about the word alone. So the simplicity of Christ as we have, uh, as we were talking about that song earlier about committing everything to him, right? I mean, we don't hold anything back as in we're not counting on any merit. We put, uh, I know I, I use way too many cliches, but we put all our eggs in one basket. Sometimes I think people can um, pick up on concepts like that instead of me trying to express some kind of King James English, you know what I mean? But that, in other words, our only hope, our only hope is in the only difference maker. I mean, I can, I can, I can thrash that and beat that thing to death, and, you know, if a person's not born again, they'll still hold something back and not even know they're holding it back. That people are so blind and deceived of their own self-righteousness. They hold things back until God gives them life, and then they drop it. <laughs> and we've got to keep hitting on those things. I don't care if it's, you know, you, most people say, well, of course you're not saved by law. But then they have lower or lesser conditions, whether it be counting on their, they put faith in their faith, or faith in their repentance, or their repentance is a certain quality. Or, you know, if they fail in all those things, it's kind of like the law, then you go to the sacrifice. Well, if they can't, 
if they if they can't repent right or, or have enough faith, they feel still feeling guilty. So at least, well, God will accept my desires. He'll accept my sincerity. I mean, they're always holding something back. The gospel explodes all that stuff and, and exposes our righteousness as being filthy rags and dung. And we say, uh, when we see God high and lifted up on his throne, and we say, uh, woe is me. <laughs> I'm unclean. I'm like one of those leprous people with leprosy. I have it all over my body. When Christ said, I came to save sinners, that, that's me. What kind of sinner? I'm without strength, dead, enemy of God, no free will, hating God. Most people, they, uh, I'm not that bad. You start talking to them about what kind of sinner God saves. Yeah, hey, you're weird. <laughs> this is the. Right. Yeah, irresistible. We and we're given eyes to see. I, I think I said it last week. Uh, <clears throat> talk about irresistible grace. Uh, it's a weird way to state it, but I, I, I like. I think it's forceful to state it this way. When we have eyes of faith, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> There's no turning back. It's, you're, it's already done to you. You're already saved. You can't do it. And it's not like you're thinking, I wish God wouldn't have done it. I mean, the, the prison door is swung open. You're out of there. And you love it. <laughs> it's not like you want to be in there anymore. But when you're not exercising the gospel, people try to put you back in there. You've got to keep that door open. And you've got to go about to do different things than you were before, not go about to establish your own righteousness, go about to serve God in the right motive and preach this gospel, make distinctions and help other people, and hopefully they will see what you see. I mean, I would hope that that's the, um, the idea where you want to be surrounded with other people that, that now believe and they worship God with you. But if you shave the offense off, I mean, we can pack a bunch. Of, we can shave the offense off and pack people in here. And uh, I mean, I know how to play some music. I know some people that play music better than me. I could get. We could get a band in here. I could pay people to play. We we couldn't meet in this room. We have to get a bigger place. But what's the point? That's the wisdom of the world, right? It wouldn't take much to improve the coffee, you know. We could do all kind of different. We, we, we could do things that jack up attendance. But it would detract from, distract from the difference maker. We don't want those things to be the difference maker. Doesn't mean we just like throw garbage on the floor and, you know, come to church in stinky clothes and not brush our teeth. You know what I mean? It, and leave the air off so we can sweat. We do these things. Just, just we try to be practical and keep focus in the right direction. Exactly, a loss of our identity, right? Exactly. Um, and that's what worship is all about. We we divest in ourself. We must decrease, and He must increase. And and of course, that works. You know, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of where we see that clearer. All right. I'm sorry for going uh, way too long. Uh, next week, July 15th, Patrick and uh, Eric will be doing a combined message on uh, preservation and assurance. So be looking forward to that. And I think probably after that, <clears throat> I may go back to, uh, I'm not going to lie, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it'll be part 17 if, we, if I'm sticking in the Chosen by Christ series. and uh, I've, I've enjoyed it and uh, looking forward to more of that. All right.